The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. It's like you're boxing. All right, so we have a very special guest for you today. We have a professional surfer, a journalist, a marine conservation scientist, ocean steward, a Guinness world record holder for ascending the world's tallest mountain from base to peak, and one of the winners of this year's WSL Impact Award, uh, Dr. Cliff Capono. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us on the lineup. Yeah, aloha. Thank you for having me. And yeah, just Cliff. No need. To, no need to yeah, yeah, doctor. yeah. I, I wanted to be formal. You, you and I haven't met before, but I'm I'm such a huge fan of everything you do. I mean, surfing included. It's mind blowing, and I'm so stoked to have this conversation. We're we're doing it remote. I'm here on the North Shore. Where, where are you at today? I'm at home in Hilo on the Big Island. So, just over the channel, a few channels. That's great. And and um, before we started recording, we were talking about um, there's been no shortage of swell, obviously, um, this part of the world, certainly this last week. Um, how's it on the big island when it when the surf is kind of this size? Do you have your spots? Do you have your, your, your places that you check out usually? Yeah, it's um, big island is funny. I think when everyone from the outer islands, there's a um, Kauai and Oahu, I think they're the the, the the spoiled ones they get all the all the soil directions and then us on the more eastern shores we kind of get trickle trickle effect so it just depends on angles so yeah this last huge eddy swell it um was the perfect block for the big island so 100 feet on oahu and uh it's like three feet over here, <laughs> over here. so <laughs> we just kind of we kind of wait for our our swell directions maybe um Maybe similar to like maybe Central California or, or maybe some places deeper. Baja. Sure. You know they don't catch all the all the angles of the the swell directions, but the ones that if you know the tides and the angles, it's pretty fun. Right on. And you are you're following up uh, another Big Island resident, Shane Dorian, for our podcast guest. So the Big Island, we're yeah. we're really creating a potent window of Big Island conversation on this podcast these two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Those are big shoes to to fill <laughs> with Shano. He's uh-huh. from the west side. He's like on the other side of the mountain. But yeah, Shane's a, like the legend. Everyone is so psyched on when Shane comes in, in a lineup. He's like really, really, uh, he's enjoyable to have in the lineup because he, he for being like, like that status in surfing mm-hmm. and kind of just as a human he he kind of comes and he says hello to everyone doesn't matter if you just moved there or if you've been there for 90 generations he says he- hello to everyone in the lineup waits t- his turn which is like it's always his turn but he'll like tell people to go <laughs> like yeah shane was is the man thoughtful guy like i i I'd met him in the past and we talked before but um really thoughtful guy um on a lot of topics and and I bring that up because kind of you describing the way he operates in the community and the respect he pays to others. Like, I do think like, especially these days, like being thoughtful, you kind of have to have, you have to be time rich in a way you have to have the space mm-hmm. to actually think and then, and then mm-hmm. act that way. And it's, it feels like it's harder and harder. And I think people are just so rushed, you know, they're like, I've got 30 minutes. I'm not saying hi to anyone. I'm just going out and taking whatever waves I can get and getting out of there. But it is cool that, that Shane's obviously designed a life and, and, um, prioritize that like, like in the way he behaves. Yeah. I mean, a huge inspiration too, just the way he like mm. has created this career for himself and kind of image, but mm. understands that th- there's so much more in this world than, than just surfing and people have lives outside of like big waves or big barrels or like, I mean, what he does is, is insane. It blows everyone's mind. If you're not a surfer, but him for also having that like from from I, I would I guess from like a younger age to get where he is now, like he has that maturity to know like and that intellect and intelligence to know like, OK, like I may surf like a thousand foot waves, but I'm going to come back and this person who fishes for their family, like I need to pay the same respect, even if they don't like know who I am. And that to me is just like really mm-hmm. um, 
it's a, it's a good way to operate. I feel Big Island is, is very much like that Hawaii Island. We, um, a lot of people surf. There's an insane amount of underground talent that surf all those waves, you know, with, with Shane and stuff and, and they're, everyone's cool. Like there's not a lot of ego here. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really great to see. Yeah. And as you said, uh, inspiring and, and on the topic of inspiration, we're going to switch subjects a little bit because, uh, you know, you yourself are, are no stranger to, um, receiving awards like, you know, native Hawaiian scholar from the university of Hawaii at Manoa in 2018, uh, wave saver of the year from the save the wave coalition, the same year, John Kelly awards from surf rider Oahu, the same year, geez, 2018 was a big year for you. Um, and then, you know, uh, this, this, Obviously, I saw a bunch of cuts of this before it went live, but and and was struck by it every time I watched it. But your even your message in the We Are One Ocean film from 2020 has won awards at four different film festivals. Um, oh. And um, yeah, and and I mean, I I think kind of tracking into this year as a recipient of the the WSL Impact Award, you know, it's an award that recognizes individual surfers who demonstrate the greatest impact and out, outstanding effort to, as you said, like inspire, educate and empower our global surf community to protect our, our one ocean um, while aligning with our equality and inclusion values. And you are a recipient of this award this year. And, and um, how does it feel? How, how, what, what were your kind of first thoughts when you heard? Well, yeah, I mean, when you put it all like that, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> mind blowing. I, I kind of just was talking to John about it. Like, hey, Tim, like <laughs> we think you, you're a good fit for this um, award. And, and to me, like, I, I'm not really like a um, award kind of person, like personally for me, like I, hmm. um, what, what makes me feel like super honored and, and just humbled by it is that um, a lot of it is with the work that I'm doing um, hmm. and to know and see like, work gets celebrated um and rec i mean mostly may maybe recognized and you know the, with the world surf league having such a um a global reach across like our entire planet and for you know the world C surf league to be kind of sifting through i mean like to be alongside like felipe and um uh, um brissa like it's like um it's pretty crazy to like mm. To, to have that um the work celebrate with their work because they're like in surfing they're they're like on the forefront of putting forward these really incredible efforts in the ocean mm. and to be recognized uh my work at least the work that i'm a part of it's not really my work like i'm just a part of it and what i feel is like purposeful and interesting like i just think it's cool what i'm doing mm. for me yeah and when other people think it's like cool i i i want to party with them and i want to be like let's let's do it together <laughs> and then when it gets recognized as being valuable um yeah that's just something that i feel um is is kind of like maybe a bit overwhelming sometimes because as surfers and just as humans maybe we want to be valued and we want mm. our our existence to be valued and i've been kind of doing my own trip for a while now and uh, it gets lonely sometimes, you know, like people are maybe don't really understand, like, why are you trying to like, you know, do these test tube experiments and then travel throughout the night to like get a real tube in the water? Like what they, they may not be really understanding. And, and for a long time, it's been like a really long time of me doing this type of work. And when you, you kind of get that mental anxiety in my Am I wasting my time or am I, mm. is this valuable for other people? Cause at the end of the day, you know, if it's not helping others, right. what's really the point. And then for it, is to that like a, a self doubt thing? Like, where, yeah, you know, where, yeah, yeah. You just, you're, you want to believe cause it's fun. Like that, what you do is worth something to someone else. Right. Uh, yeah. And then, but you don't know. And then it's been kind of like such a long time of doing it. You kind of, you question, you question mm. if you're, you're helping others. Am I like, helping my community and then for there to be that response like you, your work is helping your community and you belong to a global community that's like wow you know like yeah. um yeah it, it wasn't really explained to me the award like how you just 
explained it. So it makes me feel like, wow, that's like a, a huge honor, you know, and I'm really appreciative of that. Yeah. You know, and, and it, just hearing you talk about it too, like it, it reminds me that there's this conversation. I'm going to try to bridge this as best I can, but you know, Malcolm Gladwell years ago had this theory that he was talking about called like the second conversation in sports. And, and the way he looked at it was, you know, the first conversation is whatever's happening on the court or the field or, or in the boxing ring or whatever. It's like this person punched that person, that person fell down. He goes, but the second conversation in culture about that sport is what makes the first conversation worthwhile. And, and his example was, and it can go in either direction. And his example was with boxing. He said, you know, boxing for decades was the second conversation is this is a sport for like upward social and economic mobility. It didn't matter what your background was. If you could like mm. physically beat the other person, like you could be rich and famous and all these things. He goes, and that's what made it so popular and so potent. He goes, and then after the corruption and the scandal in boxing, that, that became the second conversation. Mm -hmm. It kind of imploded the whole thing. And I, I bring this up too, because I do think that this is a very real thing in the way how like humanity processes like what we're doing. And we're fortunate for the We Are One Ocean program at the WSL because it does create like a... a sub momentum of purpose, right? We, we have the world's best surfers. We've got this huge platform, but going back to your point, like what is it actually doing? Like what, like, is it inspiring people? Do we even have messaging in place to do it? And that's been something we've been working on for a while. And I think about that when you, when you kind of describe your work, because it does seem so radically infused with purpose or, or, or at least aspiring to be purposeful. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. And, and it's cool. You know, like I feel like we need our champions in, in life. You know, mm. we need to have those winners. We need to have that healthy form of battle. You know, like in, in our culture, we had um, a, a long portion of the year designated to like warfare, um, mm. violence. Uh, yeah. Not that that was the priority, but there was an allowed time to really mm. celebrate that. And then there was three months that we, we there was a peace time where we, we knew that there, but you still had um, games and he still had like a way to see champions because like I feel as humans, we, we need to see that. We need to like see an individual have a goal and complete it because we're kind of like we're all doing our world titles in our own life every day just in a different way. And it, we can gain inspiration and like, you know, to see these champion competitors also receive this award. And that's what I, I really think is super progressive about this award. It's not just designated for like eco people or like mm. the, you know like inclusive people or diversity people but it's like across the entire um spectrum of yeah. what um wsl is trying to cater to which is like the governing body of surfing um sure so like to be a part of that i just think it's it's really progressive i think i i would hope that these sort of impact awards um take a, maybe a little bit of um inspiration from it too to know that like um you know, maybe we can get teachers as these mm. impact awards or like uh, lifeguards, you know, <laughs> or like uh, emergency response personnel, you know, like mm -hmm. these are people if they're alongside like, a, you know, a Zeke Lau or like mm -hmm. uh, John John, like Carissa Moore, like that's going to like begin our, our community to say, hey, look, like, you know, the, the Lifeguard Association on the North Shore, those recipients, Nolan Keolana, he's receiving an award alongside of, you know, Eli Olson Big Wave Award. Like to right, me, it just, right. it starts to elevate a more diverse conversation of what it means to be impactful and, and also like maybe what it means to be like aspiring to be the best. Totally. And the, I love the way you put that too, because I think what that does is it stresses that you know, there actually is a connection like between surfers everywhere and between people who want to do this work everywhere. And as you pointed out, like it's not just one group of people that's being honored and, and it, not that that's sort of overtly exclusionary, but I think when one group gets honored consistently in a, in a, in a certain way, everyone who's not part of that group goes, well, that's not for me, you know, and mm -hmm. the reality is it, it, it is. And, and I think that's a nice thing about surfing because even on the surfing side of things, like what you do surfing wise and the boards you ride and, and your approach 
is not to me any uh, any any uh, it's not it's not separate from the championship tour. You know, it's all surfing, and I think they draw inspiration from you probably just as as you draw it from them. And I think that's a, a really cool way to, to think about it. For, for the the listeners out there, um, can you explain uh, what the Mega Lab is and 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 the work you've been doing there? Yeah, so the Mega Lab is uh, alongside the work. You know, this is the work that I, I'm. Something that I'm really passionate about is elevating scientific literacy. Like I, I, I really dig science. Like I, I think it's really cool, and I just enjoy it. Like um, I feel it's something in society that could potentially improve everyone's life. If you got a little science, you'll you'll be happier. Like it just no matter no matter what it is. So for me, I kind of want to um, share that feeling of stoke that I have in science within the surf community, because I get like that same rush by learning about how the, the, the world works and how our ocean works, how our planet works. Like when I, when I get that understanding, it's almost like unlocking something in surfing as well. Like, okay, like taking off behind the boil or like learning how to like release your fins, like all those little things that you learn. It's like that same feeling of capturing a, um, a, a capturing something new and like that's what i like about science so um what the mega lab is it's just a it's a place where surfers skaters and artists can come to feel that um that rush of science i guess or the stoke of science um we're uh, we're trying to redefine what it means to be a scientist by demonstrating that surfers skaters and artists can find new solutions to protect our ocean and we're hoping to give it to the people who need it the most through just the rad stuff that we try to do. So it's uh, <laughs> it's like a, it's definitely um, it's like a brand, I would say, like um, we um, but it's a science lab. So like we have a, a place where a bunch of surfers and scientists come together and artists and skaters or whoever. And we try to come up with cool solutions to protect our ocean or, or whatever the planet, really. But. We're kind of focusing on um, the changing climate, um, coral ecology of marine systems, and also how humans interact with the environment. So that's kind of our pillars that we have in the lab. And um, we work with institutions to really um, get like uh, tangible solutions implemented. Like we want to have real application, not just have great ideas or think we have a great idea and be like, oh, you know, you should like build this or take away that or do this. Like, we want to actually say, here is some science. We want to publish it. We want to provide it to the community, the scientific community, the surfing community, um, the outdoor community. And we want to say, like, we're coming up with a, um, an idea that we can now implement to help protect our oceans or protect these waves or, or something like that. Um, and yeah, we, we want to make it like a real space for people to come and be a part of the solution, uh, even if you're not formally trained in the sciences. Totally. And, th and that kind of tracks with what we were talking about before, where it's because you guys are creating an, a new look at what in, in, in kind of an inclusive environment would look at, like, you know, people from probably a, a more diverse range of backgrounds than, than previously would have been are now interested, right? Where they're like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't have to be from this part of the world and have this kind of an education and have these kinds of an interest. Like, look at all these different people that are just interested in this project. And, and, I, and that could be me. Yeah. Yeah. Surfers. I mean, surfers are smart. Like, let's be, let's be real here. Like if, if you're scoring waves, you're, you're, you gotta you understand. You figure something out. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, it's either you, you're, you're technologically savvy by understanding wind direction patterns, tides, swell period. You know, there's, there's all of that, those nerds out there. And then there's the nerds that just show up every day and take those observation um, and, and note it down. So really by, by nature, like sci surfers, good surfers, they, they have that already embedded that scientific method and embedded into their workflow. So like, uh, yeah, like I, it's just a natural fit. Now it's like giving these other types of tools, like, um, you know, just for like, like things that I, maybe you, you're not really aware of that is very scientific and you can include a new, um, way of looking at it. Like, um, one of the projects we are doing right now, working with reef footwear is we're mapping all these reefs around the world in 3d. Mm. So we're trying to find different types of reef structures that exist in hollow barreling waves. So we're starting to find like, wow, like there's waves at pipeline, waves at cloud break, 
that have these similar similar features in like the most barreling part of the wave, you know, because right. both pipe and uh, cloud break on a certain size, it, it it doesn't just barrel from takeoff sometimes and just a, a mm. perfect barrel all the way through. It kind of has like a little weird part and then it'll hit a certain part of the reef and it'll really go square. And if you look at like pipeline, you see kind of that, um, that inside shelf right before like the channel where all those photographers kind of sit just right inside of that. And there's actually a reef structure out there. Uh, and we call them these spur and grooves, like caverns that exist there. And then they also exist right inside of like the ledge out at cloud break. So we're seeing mm -hmm. these like very specific reef formations right where the heaviest part of the barrel is in both pipeline and in cloud break. And we want to go to other places like Teopo, uh, we want to go to like Uluwatu and we want to kind of test this hypothesis and say, hey, like, is the reef making the barrel? Is that like, like how, how important is this reef structure to the barrel? And then we can start to talk about, okay, so if that's the case, these coral reefs are not just important for like our biological stability. Like it has a more like a selfish value to surfers. Like we start losing our reefs, our barrels might complete our reef barrels might disappear, you know? So I don't know. It's just, it's like fun ways to think about our planet that is more relatable to someone who just wants to get tubed. Right. Yeah. And if, if the goal is to get everyone to the same destination, like a healthier planet and a healthier ecosystem, everyone can take their own path, you know, and if some people are going to be motivated by, yeah, no, I want, you know, my kids and their kids and other people's kids. I want, I want the future of humanity to have a, a healthy planet. That's one road. If some other people are like, I can't imagine not having a barrel. That's another yeah. road, right? But we're all going to get yeah, to the same yeah. place. Like, yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sweat people with if you do something bad, you're a bad person. Like I, I really am not the kind of person that wants to shame or say that my path is for everyone. Cause I'm, I'm very privileged and, and maybe I have a different privilege than um, some other people, but I recognize my privilege and, and my privilege is growing up with a culture with clean air, clean water, mm. uh, accessibility to a, a pristine ocean and a food source and being given all of these things that um, it's tough, you know, for people who maybe grew up in say LA or I don't know, New, New Jersey, maybe even, you know, these people may have not have that privilege of knowing how to interact with their environment. So I don't want to be like, oh, you guys are blowing it. Like all you do mm. is like pollute. And you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be that person. I, I would hope I can share the work that shows, hey, we all got a struggle that we got to go through to find a balance uh, and just just do what you can. And that's going to make such a huge impact by just knowing a little bit of the science of how it works. And I think it will empower more people because I, I really feel people, given all the information, they're going to make the better decision and they're going to want to, you know, be good people. I, I, I could be like naive, but like that's what I like to believe. I love it. Well, you know, congratulations again on, on your WSL Impact Award. And yeah, uh, we're going to take you. a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the path of Cliff Capono. We'll be right back. So, so just before the break, Cliff, we, we were talking about, you were talking about that you feel privileged with your upbringing and, and the path you've been on. But for the listeners out there, tell us a little bit about that. What was your situation like growing up? What was your family like and, 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 and where? Yeah, I, um, so I was born in a place called Ko. Uh, it, it's pretty much downtown um, Honolulu uh, on Oahu. And uh, I was born in Queens Medical Center. It was, it was founded by some of our royalty um, mm. uh, that created a, a like a healthcare system for Native Hawaiians. Because at the time, in like the mid eighteen hundreds, there was uh, definitely some um, social and uh, I guess governmental issues that were happening in Hawaii, and a lot of the Native Hawaiians um, people were passing from disease and infection. So this hospital called Queens Hospital was created to give Hawaiians access to medical care, which is where I was born. I was born in this place. Uh, and then I grew up for a few years in Kailua um, on the east side of Oahu. And then when I was small, we moved and relocated, my family relocated to uh, Hilo on Hawaii mm -hmm. Island. And 
yeah, I pretty much just grew up here on the big island and um, surfing. There, there's like no surf industry here at all. Right. There's no um, <laughs> like uh, I think there's like two surf shops growing up. And uh, one of them was kind of catering more towards the people who came off of the ship. And then mm -hmm. one was like a kind of a more roots uh, surf shop. And uh, yeah, I could afford nothing in any of those. Like there was like no way I was getting new boards. And um, it was all about the people who visited Hilo to leave boards. And when I was growing up, kind of the traveling pros that would come by, it was like Makua Rothman, he would come and hang out with a lot of the Hilo boys and he would leave some boards. But usually like the boys, the, the older guys got the board first pick and stuff. But like in like five years, maybe you might get it when it's like broken half. You're like, yeah, that was like Makua's board and you get to like fix it. So um, yeah, it's just if if someone caught whiff of some of these like more um, intense type of waves that we have here and they wanted to surf them and they came over mm -hmm. like and they a lot of people wouldn't leave boards kind of when I was growing up. But like if you could get a board that was kind of like a big deal growing up like we all had brown boards um right. and maybe kona had a bit more the west side maybe they had a little bit more um attention maybe because of um mm. shane shane was helping a lot um the the youth there and cj kanuha and um right growing up there was there was some aspiring pros uh, tonino benson casey brown tori meister uh, that kind of crop of were like the the west side guys and they were in the spotlight and they were ripping they're so good and in the Hilo side we were kind of like brown boards duct tape and like <laughs> trying to like find our our we were just trying to find our way through the whole um social situation because uh sure in Hilo we don't really depend on tourism like the rest of um Hawaii we I would say are more of like a working class community um, our economy is filled with public servants, whether they're teachers or nurses, um, ocean safety officers, first responders, like that's kind of your path or a farmer or fisherman or fisher person. That's kind of the, the path here on this side. Um, and still to this day, it's a and with having um, there's just something about having an economy, a way to kind of make a, a living that provides for your community. You're not like exporting really importing uh financial support in your community it just makes the community feel uh like proud maybe but not sure. like in a bad way but you kind of understand that like um you have to make a certain amount of income to take care of your people right. and you will make income if your work is to take care of your people like if you want to make money and take care of other people from somewhere else, you got to go to Kona and work the hotels or you got to go to Oahu right. and, and work that. Like we're, we're very much like, um, the community takes care of the community, right? I grew up and that's within surfing, surfing, everyone surfed and people were really good. And there's so much talent on the East side. Um, that being said, it's not like, a surfing doesn't take care of anyone here in Hilo or, or it didn't when I was growing up. And that's right. kind of what I, I would maybe like, I don't know if I'm in the wrong segment or whatever here, but like, no, with no, the no, Lab, great, that, yeah. that's, that's like what I'm, I'm like, I trying to see like, how can surfing help people here? You know, like that, that would be really right. cool. You know? the, but you know, I, I just I, beautifully said, and I, and I think the thing about, you were stressing about the community of Hilo being a little bit self-sustaining because, because obviously we're fortunate that we get to travel to a lot of places. And by virtue of us traveling there, there is at least some sort of modicum of a tourism industry. But I, I think about this quite a lot and, and it, and in a way, and just hearing you talk about it, it's a little bit like being in a relationship where, you know, if you really, if you really truly want to love someone else, you have to start loving yourself first. And I think, there's maybe a parallel with the community because it's to, to welcome in people from outside the community in a way that's sort of sustaining and, and healthy. You have to feel good about yourself first. And we've all been to communities where it's like whatever the percentage is like only tourism, you know, and it, it, mm. y it's a stark difference to other places you travel. Yeah. I mean, and we, we definitely do have a, a, a tourism aspect. We have shops and mm. we have, um, there, there's people that come for our hula festival and things like that, but like that, I grew up, it's like the biggest 
like the Eddie Aikau of people in Hilo is like Merry Monarch Festival. It's like the Hula Championships where right. that, that's where everyone comes and we get our big influx of tourism and things. So it's it's like um, surfing was something that if you really wanted to advance your proficiency, you had to mm. dedicate a lot of time, extracurricular time outside of your responsibilities as being like a community contributor, if that makes right. sense. Like, no, that, to- we, that totally makes sense. We have like our, um, our local wave. It's like one wave. <laughs> and then <laughs> you have a bunch of other waves that if you really want to surf some waves like uh, of consequence and they're, they're littered around too, you know, but there's, um, we, we, you know, you, it's just an interesting way to grow up knowing that the stress that just the, the, uh, safety officers and first responders have already just for people living life, you know, like we don't have, like, if you get into a really critical situation, you have to get on the airplane or the helicopter and go to Oahu. Like even medical response is, is significantly strained because we're kind of like under, you know, when you don't have that outside money, that hotel money, you don't have that like tourism money, you don't really get all that extra resources and bonuses. So it comes at a cost. You want to be, say, you, you, we take care of ourselves. We really got to take care of ourselves. We cannot rely on the newest fancy medical equipment. So you go out to a wave that, you know, people are used to having a jet ski on the beach or sand to get in or, you know, those are like um, other privileges that are definitely uh, elevate the performance of surfing you know when you're right. able to kind of control some of those dangerous scenarios you see the level of surfing progress tremendously that's why the north shore is is there's so much talent there even in town on, on the south shore wall. and you know here there's always that kind of in the back of your mind growing up it's like uh if i get hurt here I'm one hour off road from the main road, which is two hours from the hospital. And I'm here like with one other person. So, you know, growing up, all my friends now that I grew up surfing, they're all first responders, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone knows um, like life-saving skills. And that kind of is something that makes me feel like really good now surfing with them. But (laughs) growing up, I think there's something to be said about them understanding that just by like, we've all had rescues. We've all rescued people who are growing up. um, And in a way that kind of was seen more as like the good surfers in in a weird way. Like, Mm. oh, this surfer out here growing up, like they rip, they pack huge barrels and, but they're out there on the beach, like, and they'll help you. And, you know, it's like, I was just in a special time, I feel, growing up where um, the old guard that was kind of like pounding people, <laughs> like it's kind of sure, scary. Yeah. They were kind of like um, getting older and some of them had to like get institutionalized and, and things like that. And then some of them just died. So like we kind of got put into this this new lineup, like no none of like the, the angry uncles are here anymore. And then we had kind of had that choice, like, are we going to be like, dicks or are we gonna like kind of be cool and i think um we kind of just wanted to be cooler so growing up that's how the surf that's how the surf scene was but it was never right. like uh the north shore of oahu and when like a pro would visit it, they were like uh superheroes like you know like crazy like mythical animals that would come into hilo and we're just like oh like jamie o'brien <laughs> he's here <laughs> and like everyone was like you know flynn novak came and like It was crazy. It was just crazy to see that. Like, why are you guys in Hilo? Like, you know, and and maybe not. Yeah. So surfing, I would say it it was um, so much a part of my life. That was just something that I I felt helped me to get out of uh, maybe some of the um, the social situations I was in growing up, coming from like a seemingly marginalized community. Like surfing Mm -hmm. helped me to really like elevate my status. Like the better I got at surfing the more right. I was given kind of respect and maybe seen. So right. I did it for that. I, I didn't try to get better at surfing to be a pro surfer. Um, well, I was, so I'm glad you brought that up too, because, you know, we're all products of our own respective environments and, and, you know, the environment and the community you're describing in Hilo is, is radically different than one you'd find in terms of being a surfer than, you know, the North Shore, than Orange County, Snapper Rocks, Rio, whatever, right? Um, and you found your own motivation to get very, very good at surfing because it sounds like it was about respect and status in your community. 
it, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, how you internalize the idea of getting better, right? Um, were you looking at other surfers in your community and saying, I want to do that plus this, I want to draw my own lines, I want to ride these kinds of boards? Because for a lot of kids around the world, you know, getting better is, you know, I want to, you know, do well in this contest, I want to qualify for that tour, I want to make this video part. Yeah, we didn't, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to get out, like, I was not happy when the, com in the community that I was kind of like, uh, I mean, not, I wasn't not happy with the community. It's just like, I was in a place where I felt like I, I was invisible and I felt my like people were invisible and I feel like I didn't have like a voice. So I tried to, I was getting a little bit of that, um, just within my lineups. Cause it, it's like, you know, you coming from kind of a not spotlight a spotlight town in Hawaii the yep. talent is so insane and it's just like in order to to get seen it's not just get a sticker or have a whiteboard or anything it's like you have to really be the best like to get to come like out of the darkness you gotta be like it's not just a dim light it's weird you gotta like outshine it so like for me like I grew up with a pretty gnarly age group like I was looking at like Tori Meister mm -hmm. Clay Marzo Jordy Smith, um, right. Yeah. Dusty Payne, you know, like these were the people that were, um, like they were the ones that I would go to Maui and see, and I would travel to the other islands and see, and they were like, Oh, that's the guy from the film. Okay. What is he doing? Okay. I got to surf just as hard as this kid. Like if I want right. to be seen, cause I, I didn't really have access. Like I didn't even know the I didn't even know the system. I didn't even know how it all worked. I didn't even know how, what a, how to get sponsored, any of that. It just was like, I go to that local surf shop to stare at the TV all day to watch Young Guns because Clay Mars was doing like full rotation finners. And like, then I go to Maui, I see him. I'm like, okay, he's surfing this crazy wave. Like, I got to do that too if I want to. Like that, there was no like, oh, I'm going to be kind of like a B grade or a C. Like, I didn't know. Like, I mean, right. I, I know a lot of surfers, but I just was like, those were the people who were in the surf shop in Hilo and we only had one. And so I was like, okay, that's who you have to surf certain waves and you have to surf at a certain intensity. And I just didn't have access to those tools, I think. So like, I'm like, right. okay, I'm going to try to ride this single fin. I'm going to try to do an air on it. Cause like <laughs> clay is doing, like, you know, I mean, it obviously made, what I got. No, <laughs> made no sense now, you know, but it's like, okay, like, how do I surf this slab on the single fin? That's, like, was, like, my, because, like, you know, you see, like, Lori Towner, like, like he's mm -hmm. packing backdoor barrels. Like, okay, I got to get a bigger board. Okay, uncle, the only board I have is, like, this, like, eight-channel ASIM, like, weird thruster. Like, it's that's the size board. Okay, I got to ride that board the same way. So it was definitely a little bit of... um like ignorance maybe uh, of not knowing how the whole thing worked and just kind of trying to do your best at what you got, but definitely taking from your age group. Um, and we didn't really have, like, there was no middle ground. It was either you were winning nationals coming out of Hawaii at that year, at, like at that time point, like, you know, Kiko Casamero and like all yeah, those yeah. guys that you either like winning everything or you went construction. There was no right. like, yeah, I'm right. Just yeah. kind of get a sticker and like everyone would be like, what are you doing, bro? You're not getting paid. Go to work, you know? Yeah. So that's, so that's, uh, that's, that's interesting. how it was. And that's interesting too, because you're, you're articulating all of that and you can sense like you had this super strong motivation to get very, very good. Right. And I was about to go like, was there a why at that point? Was it, I just want to experience being that good. I want to be up on the TV in the surf shop in Hilo, but it sounds like for you, you saw it as a, as a career path or at least sort of like a, 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 a mobility option for you um, and your community to an extent um, that, as you pointed out, if I get that good, then I could maybe continue to surf and, and that's how I can, I, I keep moving or the option, the other option is construction worker. Yeah, it, yeah. For for me, it was like um, people seeing Clay, people seeing Dusty, you know, people seeing Tori, people seeing Tonino, people seeing Casey Brown at the time. You know, like I wanted them to see me too. Like if they could see me, then it almost like I I kind of skipped all that other part of other people. You know, like I I just kind of was like 
maybe a little bit of like the hustle, you know, like, okay, like I got to go and I, I don't have money. I can't do any contests. I don't have money for any boards, but the person right. who wins the biggest contest, if I can gain their respect, then I know internally for myself, like everything will fall into place, you know, within my community, because then we've established that I'm worth something in, in, right. and, and at the time surfing was the only thing that I felt I could control. Like I, I'm not a, I wasn't a great student, like despite mm. having all these like degrees and stuff now, like I, I was a very average, if that student. So I feel like I had to work so hard to get like a B in, in class. And I just outworked everyone to get the grades that I needed to get. But that was like so much work and it was like so stressful. And it was like that kind of responsibility when I was gaining that, I felt like my community was kind of like my family, they would, kind of really um like there's a point where i was going in contests on other people's names because i couldn't enter in so like i would i would whoever didn't show up i would just enter in because i wanted like the grip pads and all that kind of stuff and i would like try to get to the finals just to get like the leash and the grip pad or whatever sure. and sometimes i do well and i'd be like hey look like i show my auntie them like hey look i i had to go to another name i know this is not my name but the, i'd surf for that guy and look what i got this place like would you mind giving me a little bit of money to like enter into my fees you know like i, I kind of wanted to show them like i, I think i could do it and then yeah you know getting like fifth or fourth place or whatever is like or sixth place that's not they're like yeah we'll pay like for your nssa yearly thing it's kind of expensive sure, back yeah. in the day and i was yeah, like yeah. there and you got to travel other islands and they're just like cliff like they, they'd be like yeah yeah okay okay maybe maybe and then they're like how's your grades and i show my port card and like they were like on the verge of tears when they seen like an a you know, like to right. me, it, it just that that support level. It wasn't that like I wasn't supported growing up. Just the level of support within academia that that like a lot of them like we we never had anyone in our family do this. Like you can be the first, and you can be like the first Hawaiian to like be in this space. Like when I was going to college, like I was the only Native Hawaiian in my entire like college of study, and like it was like they were so proud of me and it was just hard for me to be like admit that I really thought surfing could I don't know but getting back to it surfing I feel like I didn't have to really work too hard it was like I just needed to spend time and the more time I spend in the ocean it just was like it felt like um it was definitely work but it was like a, a purposeful work and I, I just felt like that was something in my life that I could I knew I was in control of. I wasn't in control of someone giving me an A. I wasn't in control mm -hmm. of knowing what the question was on the test. But like something inside, it's like hard to explain, but like I felt like when I was in the ocean, like I could feel like the reef and like the wind and like the tides and the currents. And like I almost could just feel like the ocean, like saying like, there's gonna be a wave coming soon and you're going to have to be prepared in these ways or you will get really really hurt like that, that was the 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 teaching and like i just enjoyed it like it just was like um it, it was just a way of learning that i really i felt like i could um i could turn it up and i can really just i could tap into something without feeling like, oh, am I good enough? I'm not like, I, I never, I don't know, it's weird. It's not, I don't think it's like a confidence. It's just like a, a security in surfing that um, that's what that's what surfing was. And it was about, I, I felt like I could, I could be seen in this. Like I know I could, when I surf with the best in the world, I can like just be with them. You know, I'm not trying to say like right. I'm better no, or no, anything. No, 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 I understand I, you know, what you're like, saying. It's just, I just wanted to be seen. And if these people who have a global influence and voice and, and that, if they're able to like, like shake my hand and be like, yeah, Cliff, that was cool. Or, you know, like I, I appreciate you to me, that kind of brought me out of the place that I was at in society. And I'm like, okay, I just elevated myself so I can walk around with my head up high, knowing that the people who are seen see me and I don't got to worry about all the other people who don't see me because right. growing up as a Hawaiian, a Hawaiian male, especially with all the stereotypes and stigmas um, and environment, 
it can be very uh, lonely and very dark. So, you know, that, that was kind of my like motivation in life, really. Uh, and science was there too. And, and, and I loved it too. I, I love it. I still do. Um, but it, but, surfing was never but, a career. Like, right. But, thing. but also like hearing you articulate the, the motivation side of things, it makes me think of, you know, there is nowhere to hide in surfing, right? In, in the sense that when you're out in the water, when you're out in a lineup, when there's other like world-class surfers out there, um, or just people who understand world-class surfing, like everyone knows who's the best in the water, right? They, they, it's not, there's not kind of this artificial structure where people can hide and maybe they can play politics and maybe it's a little unclear who the, the best at it is. But in surfing, it is like game recognizes game and, and, and CT surfers could be in a lineup with you and go like, yep, he, that surfer is elite and, and vice versa, right? It doesn't matter which stickers you have on your board or how brown your board is. It's, it's the surfing kind of does the talking. Y you brought up uh, science and, you know, just looking at your accomplishments and your careers, you know, I, you say you're not a professional surfer, but you, you do surf and you do inspire a lot of people and you're forward facing, but on the educational side, you know, you get a uh, master science in molecular bioscience and bioengineering from the university of Hawaii in Manoa, and then a PhD in chemistry at UC San Diego at the Scripps Institute of oceanography. And, and looking at the kind of the two paths in your life of, of, of academia um, and then surfing, anyone that does either like and accomplishes what you have would be like a pretty well-lived life. I don't understand how you had time to do, do both, but I, I want to hear about it because it's, yeah, it's really impressive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't even know how either. It's like, uh, <laughs> like, like, like I was saying, like it, growing up, like trying to like, yeah, there's a fantasy to be a pro surfer for sure. But I, the reality was like, I just got to be as good as a pro surfer. Um, mm. And then coming to California, going to school that, somehow manifested where I was getting, you know, financial support, very, very, very modest in the beginning. Like, um, so like, it was like, that just was like, Whoa, I, I, you know, it gave me like this, like, and now I was, I got my first contract at 27. So I'm like way late in the game. Careers are ending fucking, or sorry, <laughs> the careers are ending by the time, That's right. <laughs> you know, like, um, by, by the time I got my first one. Um, and then, when that happened, I think like it allowed me to live kind of this like early life of like uh, living in the underground. Cause we all know, like you're talking about the underground is gnarly, like, and, and, you know, real recognizes real in that space. Um, and I just wanted to be in that uh, going up to California. I feel like the opportunity started to happen. A, a lot of it, I would, I would give credit to um, guys like C um, Damien Hobgood, um, Jensen Young Sick was the filmer for Fox for uh, for a long time, and um, yeah, just like people like there, like JoJo and um, the Goodangs, like people who were just in it pretty deep, recognized, and like that started to happen. So I was um, for better or for worse. Then it gave me a little bit of like um, <laughs> like a little blood in the water. You know, I was just thinking like, okay, like I I I'm not even gonna try. Like I I decided to go up at 25 to Southern California to pursue a PhD because I'm like that's gonna be my impact. I kind of was like, I'm not gonna um, worry about surfing anymore. And then when I went up there and like people were like, oh, what's your what's your deal? And I'm like, oh, like I'm going to school. And they just, you know, like people like Visla, you know, um, came into my life and really were like, we dig that. Like we dig that you're you're surfing you know the way you surf and you're also getting a phd and i was like oh really like, yeah we want to support you to live that lifestyle and i just was like whoa like in the beginning it was very it was modest but to get anything like it was like i didn't care if it was one penny i was like what i can't believe like there is a surf company out there with such amazing athletes and artists that like but like with like paul like i mean who like ran billabong you know what i mean and like Vinny, mm -hmm. who was at spy like all these people who are like managing this thing and chris evans who ran patagonia surf like these were like the people making the decisions to say cliff we dig your lifestyle right now and um and as i started to work with them more they're like hey we kind of dig your surfing too like jump on the surf train you know and i was like then I was like traveling with like like insane surfers and it just was like, I just was blowing. Like I went on a trip with that surfer magazine, like, and I just was like, 
like tripping, like super tripping. My professors were tripping at me like, dude, where are you? You got to get your schoolwork done. So there was this, um, I felt like um, maybe my ability was interesting to the California surf industry enough to allow me to kind of like, you know, afford some beers and burritos, you know, and a little bit of travel. And maybe they and maybe Visla at first was just thinking like ah yeah he'll get over it it's like not that much and I just was like taking all that and putting in like trips and I started like kind of like building this thing like oh this is how I did my science now like now that I like it's um you have resources to try to start to develop a program so I, I kind of was like with that mindset like build my surfing in a way like I built my science I already have built my science into a semi-successful academic career I just took that those skills that I've developed applied them to surfing and by like two three years in the contract like I got raises and like I started getting a, a part of you know like experimenting with more new boards and like being able to travel better waves and opportunities to surf like really amazing waves and um I would take that back to my science classes and, and just say like hey like I'm I was like I don't surf at all I just <laughs> I just show up and do my <laughs> exam and I leave and I I worked really hard like I think during those um 6 years in California um yeah like I I was um I was trying to be as um keeping as healthy as I could um I was very minimal partying if if that at any like I was very much working on my body to stay healthy and also training my mind to be like um focused for long hours so I would spend a lot of sleepless nights in the lab um mm. and in the morning very tired as well and like it could be and i but i knew i just had to be strategic like i if i couldn't be on every swell i had to pick the best swells you know so those right, are swells right. at like the best waves in california and make sure that even if i was tired um just believe in that um preparation and stuff so that's what i did to get to the point where i graduated and and felt like i was in a place where i could choose either as a full-time right. job that was like kind of my goal i just wanted to get a point where because I, I was thinking oh maybe i'm gonna have to make a, a decision at the end of this which one would i go to so i wanted to like kind of like raise both as high as i could to like choose the better right situation but in a really crazy way by like trying to raise both equally they merged and at that time when I thought I had to make a decision whether I wanted to pursue more surfing or pursue more science, the identity of like surfer scientist molded into itself and now has become like my, my path. So I just lucky, like it's, it's just really like a lot of luck. Well, I, it's, I was going to say when you said, you know, I was going to have to choose between either. It's like, sounds like you chose both and it's working out pretty <laughs> yeah. well. I, I, I think it's, it's fascinating too, because everyone has their own relationship to surfing and everyone's story is a little bit different, but like, you know, as a kid from the suburbs, like when I got into surfing, I'm like, wow, this is it, like a very expansive window to something that's not as homogenous as where I'm from. You know, I could, I'm like, these people are traveling to these places and I'm learning about different cultures and different ways of thinking. And it was just really expanding for me. And, and that was really, really awesome. And then, you know, I you know, go to school and you have a job and all these things. And, and it, I kind of noticed just working in, in media at the time when surfing around, you know, the early oddies, early 2000s, um, it started getting really insular. Like when social media came online or everything kind of moved online, it became less about sort of expanding points of view and, and, and different touch points and more about like, all right, what wax are we using? Like, what about this fin setup, et cetera. It was like really, really like inside baseball and, and the, the world felt smaller. And I feel like over the last few years, there's been a lot of entities in surfing, um, the surfers leading it themselves, who are who are not singularly dimensional. You know, they're multidimensional and they've got all these awesome interests. And I think the media and the brands and everyone's catching up and to the point where it, it reminds me of your story where for a brand like Vizsla or even for the scientific community, it's not about like one or the other. It's like, hey, they can be mutually beneficial and having more dimensions to these things is, is, is actually really interesting. Yeah, it, it's been the, on a, the, the bones of the character have been around for a while. It's a character mm -hmm. that 
wants to surf the best waves on the planet and also do stuff that they like to do. That could be partying, that can be art, that can be a band. Mm. The free surfer party person has been around for a while. The free surfer artist has been around sure. for a while. I'm just like the surfer, free surfer molecule guy. Like I, I dig, like in my <laughs> spare time, I love tripping on on molecules, you know? Like, and to me, that's like a, where I feel like the character that I fall short of, like, obviously, like, I, I know now being a part of this, like, we surfers within this space have to adopt sort of a persona or an identity or a mm. character or a brand in order to find some sort of financial uh, incentive, really, to keep being in, in a part of the whole machine. Um, and... And, and I accept that. And I accept that this surfer scientist character, I, I try to live up to it as best as I can. You know, I, I make I make not the greatest decisions as well that are not in line maybe with the character that I try to represent. Um, I just am super appreciative to this industry, this small space that we have in our global, you know, social spectrum in surfing that I have like a, a tiny little voice that can say like science science is pretty sick you know like i mean that to me is like very meaningful and um I, I think that there's people out in surfing today have recognized that some people are doing influencing only fans some people are you know winning world titles but i think it's uh it's really cool that the surf community i, I i'm appreciative to the surf industry for giving me the opportunity to put science on the menu and I appreciate mm. so much to the surfing community for consuming it. And there is there is that um, appetite because then now I can go back to the surf industry and really other industries and say like, hey, like science is a tasty part of society that people might really enjoy. And the way we get it served in school is lame. And it's like it's not prepared the right way. But like in surfing, we can prepare this this ideas of science in a very tasteful way that people will eat and enjoy, you know, and that's, yeah, that's the work, you know, and that, that's just why I'm like, just still like really just so appreciative to surfing and the industry and, and the sponsors and the organizations and everyone. Cause they're, it's like, they're, we're writing a new chapter in surf history, like one that is involved with science and it's rad, you know, like it's cool. We're doing something new, you know? building on the old, but we're going forward together, you know? Uh, I'm going to pull on your uh, molecule guy comment from a moment <laughs> ago. Um, you know, the, the late comedian Bill Hicks once said, uh, you know, we're all part of the same singular consciousness experiencing life subjectively. And that makes me think a little bit of, of the Surfer Biome project, which, which you worked on, where you were looking, uh, as I think it was at your time when you were a doctoral student at UCSD, and, and you guys were collecting hundreds of chemical samples from surfers across five continents to map the maps you map the, the, the surfer microbiome. And, and you were quoted as saying, you know, you're more molecularly related to someone in Morocco that surfs than you are to someone who doesn't surf that lives just down the street. So uh, two part question was Bill Hicks, right? When he said that. And uh, secondly, like, you know, kind of go into a little more detail on, on, on what that project was like. And, and if you still kind of like believe the findings today, because this was a few years ago. Yeah. I mean, Billy, Billy was spot on with that one, <laughs> you know, and I think, uh, you know, our, our connection, you know, our connection on a molecular level that we have, it's defined when you, you look at it, it's all about perspective, really. So if we adopt the perspective that um, the world, the microbes that exist on our body, in our body, define our identity, they're a part of our identity. 99% um, of the DNA that exists in and on a human is microbial. 1% um, is like human derived. So like we are this like walking ecosystem of human tissue and cells with also like microbes, like bacteria, fungus, protists, and stuff like that. So if we adopt that perspective, then really we begin to ask, okay, do those microbes differentiate between different humans? So that was the big question mm -hmm. that the Surfer Microbiome Project was asking. And does the ocean have an impact on that definition? So... 
that's kind of like what I was exploring using surfing and, and to like backtrack, that's kind of where like, um, the, the merging of the surf and the science came with that. Basically my, my professor kind of got whiff that I was spending some time doing surf stuff and kind of getting a little bit of recognition in surfing, very small at the time, um, in California. And he called me into his office and I thought he was going to be like, anytime I get called in his office, I know I was in trouble and he's all like, Hey, so how's the surfing going? And I'm like, what? I don't <laughs> Uh, what are you talking about? I'm here working all the time. Like he expected me to be 60 hours a week in the lab on top of my classes. So like, mm-hmm. it was like highly competitive and, and super intense. I'm like, no, nah, sure. dude, I'm, I'm in the lab, like friggin' 60, 80 hours a week. Like, I don't, sur- when am I going to surf? And he's like, what about this? And he showed some like little things, like pictures that were like on social media. I don't even know how he found me on social <laughs> media or, or whatever he was looking at me. He was like uh, surfing or stacking clips at the time. I don't even know if you remember. Oh, like, you right. remember yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, forget, I forget what it was, but he found it. I'm just like, oh man, Dr. Dorstein, how'd you find this in the deep web or whatever? Yeah. So How do like, you stacking- have time to find this about me? Like, are we all yeah. supposed to be in the, like, come, what are we doing? stacking <laughs> clips. Like, <laughs> like, oh, but then he, um, he's like, well, what about this? And I was like, oh, and I was like trying to deny that it was me and stuff. And then he's like, look, can you do this with science? And I was like, uh, yeah. And he's like, okay. Like this, and he kind of was like, this is like, we were already kind of on a rocky terms in the lab because I was surfing so much. And he's just like, if you can bring science, surfing into science and give that same level of attention to the science, I think it's going to be okay. So I was like, oh, so I left. I went back to my dorm or my um, house at the time. And I was like thinking about dinner. I'm like, okay, I've always wanted this. I always want an opportunity to bridge science and surfing together. How am I going to do this? Like now I'm like kind of like put in like, you know, when you always say you want something, you get it. And you're like, oh shit, like I got to figure it out. That's what happened. And he, um, he allowed me to create the Surfer Microbiome Project. And that was what it was. I was learning about how to do molecular analysis on skin and different systems in the body, uh, microbiome work. So that was that whole thing. I came to this idea, this one page proposal, like, does nature affect the microbial community of humans? And he's like, okay, sounds good. How are you going to test it? I was like, okay, I need like, I need to find this like demographic of like people who are always in the ocean and like they're constantly immersed. And then I was like, oh yeah. He's like, where are you going to find them? Where are you going to find people that are always going to the beach every day? And then they're going to make sure that they're always like, you know, coming back and this and that. I'm like, I think I have a good idea of the type of people like surfers you know, they're willing to, you know, risk employment and grades and relationships to constantly immerse themselves in the marine environment. So I told him like, okay, here we go. Let's, let's design it. So we designed it. Um, and then it ended up getting funded by the Global Health Institute at UCSD, which funded my entire, like it gave me two years of funding um, and scholarship to be, to finish out my PhD. So that allowed me to go on the trip and sample all these surfers. And then I just was like, this is my um what's like the i don't even know the word for it but like you know like your your final written whatever like oh like magnum opus right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, this is the this is the peak of my career this is what i was was like if and i because like i was just like i'm coming back home to fish or be an ocean safety officer, <laughs> right like yeah, whatever but, but like, i would have done like, this yeah yeah <laughs> i'm gonna run it hard and that's where it was like i was like where are the waves i want to surf and i was like I-, I would love to surf like those crazy waves in ireland morocco like punta de lobos like uh, mavericks i just like all the waves i wanted to surf i just put it in there and um i just didn't look back and i, I ran with it and while we were sampling the community of surfers um they started to really like ask questions and they would give me the survey of like what their lifestyle was so i got this really kind of like um really detailed survey of people's lifestyles Mm -hmm. and i tried to correlate that back to what types of microbes that existed on them and i was recognizing that um when we did statistical analysis and everything there was actually a relationship on a molecular level uh, between surfers across the world and when we compared it to non-surfers we seen there wasn't those same types of relationships Um, And a lot of them are ocean bacteria that there's Mm. ocean bacteria. The DNA of this ocean bacteria was being detected on the skin of surfers. And what's more interesting to me is that the more you go into the ocean, the higher concentration of that ocean bacteria DNA existed on the skin. So like I inferred that as 
okay, you're more related on a molecular level if we think about microbiomes to someone on the opposite side of the planet who's a surfer than someone who is in your even building that doesn't go to the ocean because the ocean is giving you these bacteria, these microbes that are they're remaining on your body and they're lasting for kind of a long time. Um, mm. And the more you go into the ocean, the more you have it. It's like a dose-dependent dis- uh, dose response, we say, like medically or whatever. So like the <laughs> more you do it, the more you have, meaning like the ocean connects us and it is a resource to gain more of that connection, you know? And Brian Keolana always says, like, you know, he's so, he loves saying that, you know, the ocean doesn't separate us, it connects us. Mm-hmm. And now there is some empirical evidence, like scientific data that supports that philosophy. And that philosophy, like Uncle Brian talks about, is really embedded into a Hawaiian identity that we are the place we are from. Like we don't separate, like we say in Hawaiian, we are Hawaii. We are this place, just like the bird and the fish and the rock and the tree and the wind and the rain and the snow. Like we are all the same thing. We are what makes it. And that's like, now there's this contemporary way to say that connection using science which is radical. Like to me, I'm just like, I get so pumped on that, you know, like, wow. Like I know my people have said this for so long, Mm -hmm. growing up in a place where I feel they are no longer being heard, being seen in these spaces and saying exactly what my ancestors said thousands of years ago has made me feel the most seen that I've ever been. You know, because it's deeper than just me. It's like, it's like in my bones has been seen. And like, yeah, that that was just, that's why it mat- this stuff matters to me, you know? Yeah. No, I got goosebumps. I mean, it's it, in, I mean, especially in 2023 where, you know, the pursuit of truth is so important to so many people and, and a lot of people can passionately get that wrong often, right? Just because of the way our society is. And for, for you to kind of describe that, you know, your ancestors both intuitively and experientially knew this truth and that you were able to take that like innate knowledge and then express it and prove it out in a completely different language, you know, academic or scientific language is probably like, it's probably so incredibly rewarding, I'd imagine. Yeah. I mean, at the end of at the end of the day, through a project like that and like the work I'm trying to do, um, I just feel like surfing has given me a voice and mm. science has given me something to say. And mm. that's kind of how I'm I'm moving forward now. <laughs> Very well said. And the thing I do like about all this too is that for all those kids out there that are obsessed and love surfing, but maybe struggle in school. Like here is a success story, like someone <laughs> operating at the highest levels in both spaces and making it work. It's uh, it's really genuinely I- inspiring to hear. We're going to take another quick break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. You know, one of the things that, the, that you mentioned earlier as it pertains to you know, your life as a, as a professional surfer and a, a Vizsla ambassador is you actually ride a, a hugely diverse array of surfboards and ride them so, so well. And, and it, it's really cool to see you. Obviously, you know, we, we talk to a lot of championship tour surfers on this podcast, you know, and they generally fall into two camps. There are those that are comfortable experimenting with different kinds of shapes and those that are like, I have to ride my Ferrari in every single condition, every single day to make sure it's as sharp as possible. And I, I understand the psychology behind kind of both schools of approach there, but for yourself, you know, what, what, do you feel like there is a strong connection when you ride, let's say, a single fin and then hop on a twin fin and then hop on a thruster? Like you learn things on different boards or different lines or different parts of the wave, and then you're able to kind of translate those to different equipment. And if so, you know, tell us about some of the board builders that you work with. Yeah, for me, like when I, 
it's interesting because I feel I grew up in an era where, I mean, I grew up in the, um, the end of maybe the Taylor Steele, you know, monarch and, right. you know, with like, uh, the modern collective kind of moved into that, that sort where it's like, it became a lot about, uh, above the lip surfing and then towards kind of in, in my adult years, it, it kind of started going back into, uh, maybe a bit more power and flow and, and I think there's a lot more celebration especially today into like the history of surfers you know like there's like Mark Akilupo is still like as, as maybe even more relevant today than maybe some of right, like the right. last 10 15 years you know like um, people like Tom Curran like people are still celebrating these people who are so out there surfing incredibly well even though they took like a hiatus of like <laughs> being in the spotlight for like a decade or right. two or whatever so it's just like i mean outside of kelly uh, uh for sure and maybe shano and stuff but like um you know i think it's like we're in a space now where there's accessibility to um experiment and i think a lot of people have been experimenting throughout the years there's a lot of people sure. been on their own trip but now there's um uh, support. Uh, there's lending of the microphone to people to uh, explain their their experiences with this. Like you know, with like a bird shed down in San Diego, like bringing in mm-hmm. like people to write his all the the history of boards that he has. You know, like Channel Islands pulling in from the database or the archives of different models and fine tuning them. Like I think there's just a it's a safe place to be weird now with board right, design. Right. Which for me, I'm like, oh, that's cool because it was weird when I was growing up. So like, <laughs> right. I, I wrote a lot of these weird things um, that maybe didn't really work as much because I was like, again, I was like looking at like modern collective and stuff, you know, right, thinking, yeah. how do I get a single fin to like do flip or whatever? <laughs> Where like now there's um, there's a place to just do a high line or there's a place to mm. be able to get barreled, you know, and then. There's, there's an opportunity to still contribute to the surf organism, um, as Dave Rosovich likes to call it, in a way that is beyond just the thruster, you know, the, right. that. Uh, so, like, for me, I, I love to express myself in different ways, but I think the, the most, in order to maintain a level of proficiency in the ocean, I feel there's something about speed. Mm. And when you operate... No matter if it's a bottom turn or a top turn or a barrel or a cutback or an air or whatever it is, I feel at speed is a totally different experience than when you're just completing a maneuver without speed. Like to right. me, like that idea of going really fast, it's the direct translation of that energy that is mm. given to you by the wave. Like to me, that's like the only like if we look at like WSL speed power flow or whatever, sure, power. Yeah, yeah and flow those are things made up and that's human control speed is given to you by the ocean so like mm. that's like a variable that the ocean gives us so to me it's kind of like the priority like i want to just go fast i want to feel that energy of the ocean um whether it's like in the curl or you know feeling that speed so for me the boards that's their main um obviously maneuverability all that stuff but like i, I want to be able to feel that that f- speed you know and that's where i look at a glider can give you that same you're flying at that speed where you wouldn't be doing that on like a uh, a short board in like knee high waves you're like you're trying to generate the speed instead of allowing the ocean to give you that so the boards that i ride they're always trying to find how do i um, participate how do I maximize my um, capture of energy of the ocean and that's what just all the boards are about they're um, they're like gliders or fishes or single fins or sometimes short boards or slab boards or big wave boards like to me it's never like about trying to perform it's about capturing that energy you know does that make sense it, of course and it seems like such an important like philosophy to have your, to have underpinning your surfing approach. Right. Because I think a lot of people, and I've been guilty of this in the past too, where it's like, I just want to go out and do an air, or I just want to go out and look like that. So I need this board to do that. Whereas actually the better way to be able to surf at that level is to say the, my approach should be about leveraging and maximizing and be as in harmony as possible with the momentum of this energy on the wave as possible. 
And if I'm being true to that, then, you know, my cutback will be in the right place and my top turn will be in the right place. And the equipment I arrive will be at least drawing off of that philosophy as opposed to, I want to go do this thing because you're kind of taking the actual wave and the canvas out of the equation when you do the, the latter. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, you look at like Craig Anderson, like his airs, like they, he looks like a bird, you know, he's like, he's so mm. like loose and like off axis and like, he's like riding like thermal waves, you know, up there, you know, like it's, it's just, right, right, yeah. to me, it's like, um, that's, that's where that human is like, he's expressing himself in that, in that way. Am I supposed to do that too? Like, I don't know. Right. He, he just has a, he comes from a whole nother world. He's, he's, he's a whole nother like species in my mind of like, or type mm. of animal, ocean animal, you know, and then you get someone like Shano, like just is like finding into like being deep or like Mike Stewart, you know, like they've, they're exploring different parts of these waves that to me, I'm like, I, I am not trying to look like them. Right. But I would like to feel whatever's happening in those spaces. Like that's more interesting to me, you know, because I am representative of my people. Like how I surf, whether people like it or not, that's just a Hawaiian way of surfing. 90 mm. generations. And I'm not going to hate on myself. Like I, I, I don't like to like to myself up or whatever, but I'm, I'm not going to be like, I know there's a little bit of like, Oh, like talk shit on yourself when you see yourself surf or whatever. Like, right, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I think there's a level you have to have humility and understand, but I think the humility comes from knowing that you can't hate on other people, you know, like that mm -hmm. there, there's a much more like empowerment into like not hating on others instead of hating on yourself. Like I don't, cause me hating on my surfing, that's a representation of my ancestors. I, I represent mm -hmm. them and I don't, I don't want to talk shit on me. And then that's like kind of talking shit on them. Like, it's just how we do it. This is how my family does it. This is how I was taught. And um, that some people dig it. I appreciate because it's not like me. It's just mm. one form of a, a, an animal trying to find balance in the ocean. And, you know, by eating all these different types of fruit and stuff you know that's how i see it as a you're just you're you're going in a different space you're tasting the different fruits of wave riding and i i you know i give a lot of credit to people like you know thomas campbell you know he's a mm. close friend of mine and like right. him he him being able to just like provide introductions to um really insightful board builders in, in mm. our culture um, and to also like, sometimes it's nice to have someone a little bit older, really like give you like a, Hey, that's cool, bro. Like you, you, you getting a, a board and, and wanting to celebrate Ben Ipa, the sting, like single fin. That's cool. Like, oh yeah, you should try maybe a bonzer, you know, like, or here mm. you ever talk to like Travis Reynolds up in Santa Cruz about well, like we're, we're, we're good friends too. And it's like, yeah, me and Trav have been working on this design. Why don't you try it? Or try check out this Josh Hall glider down in San Diego. Or it's like, oh, dude, you should talk to Mark Andrini. And like, there's just <laughs> so many amazing board builders all over the world, you know, that like being having access, you know, to just an introduction through someone like Thomas, it, it just makes it really amazing. And, um, and people like Devin Howard at Channel Islands, you know, right. for being really receptive to being able to dip into the archives and bring back some some boards that, yeah, they're not like um, on the tour, but like they're so fun. You know, they're just so fun to ride, you know, and um, and then obviously through Visla, like the whole creators and innovators stable of shapers, like every single person on that roster they're so insane like from alex lopez like chad jackson jeff mccallum donald brink like obviously trav freaking Derek disney like oh man there's like there's i'm, I'm can't even i'm just trying to think of everyone at the thing <laughs> that we go to but we just ride each other's boards danny hess 
like Danny Hess making like Danny's like on the forefront of the bio whatever eco thing like he's right, right, taking yeah. old redwood sheds and he's making Mav guns with them and he's riding them and it, to me that's just so beautiful it's just like so beautiful to like see his approach and I don't know just that part of surfing to me is just so like it's so cool you know and, and of course I, I still ride like I ride a bunch of Channel Island surfboards sure, yeah. and um, I'm good friends with Maddie Rayner in Haula on Oahu and and a lot of their boards are polyurethane you know polyester resin and um, arguably they're pretty shit for the environment um, and it's like trying to just figure out am I going to keep riding these boards that I know will break in an effort to mm -hmm. look like someone else or am I just for me going to choose to every time I purchase a board or I'm gifted a board can that board can I see the life of that board extending beyond me and then I start thinking about those first boards that I, were, I was given. Those boards are from the 70s and the 60s mm -hmm. and the 80s. Like, can my boards be that for, like, these kids down the road? Where it's like, oh, crazy Uncle Cliff. Like, he's giving away his thrusters. Ha, ha, ha. Things don't even work anymore, you know, or something, you know. And, like, maybe there's some weird kid that's just like, yeah, I want to do front flips. Like, the guy's in, I don't know, Kona. <laughs> or whatever but i don't have access to the board so i'm riding uncle cliff's old thrusters or something you know like i think that's just uh it's worth the hiccups of not feeling like i know this board in and out and I, i'm gonna do the same turn every time every time like that can be a bit boring for me that level of security in my surfing like you mm -hmm. know like uh like i went out that last swell out on um that one that Griff got that crazy. I don't know if you've seen. He like be belly like back flopped and the like, oh yeah 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 at, 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 at pipe yeah, yeah it was like backwash and slabby and it didn't look that kind of weird and you know like I I was so lucky to get a board made by Uncle Jerry Lopez a single fin seven five um, and I was like yeah I'm taking it out there and it was dark I just paddled out and then I'm out there and I'm just like this is sketch this is so sketch being out here on this board and like. I had this one wave, Anthony Walsh was like kind of close to me and I'm paddling for a wave looking back door and he was actually in the spot to get like a nuts drainer. And he's like, go Cliff. And I was like, kind of on the apex, like kind of on the shoulder. And I'm like, ah, I don't know, you guys, no, no, go, go, go. So I got into it and it was like a late drop and and, and it wasn't like a crazy wave. And I didn't get barrel, I didn't even get barrel at all. Like, but the drop, I like barely made it and I was ready to jump. And I think on a regular thruster, or like my like happy traveler CI border. I probably would have jumped just being late on the apex. But like something in my mind just was like, Uncle Jerry made you this board. Like <laughs> trust the board. And it, like single fin, like I just put the rail into the wall and I just dropped into it. And I just said, okay, like take it from here, Uncle G. And somehow made the drop, not getting barreled, not even close to like any type of barrel rode the thing out and then kicked out and it was like uh, if it was to be scored i don't know i'm not really good at scoring like maybe a negative five uh, at back <laughs> it was like a terrible uh terrible wave in most people's minds but for me that feeling that i was able to like have an experience with the board um that maybe wasn't designed for that moment but somehow it was shaped so well it got me safely. Like I definitely could have got hurt on the wave and to get me to safety sure. like that to me just feels like uh, those experiences in surfing to me outshine doing an air reverse um, every time. You, you mentioned, you know, the stable of board builders, um, the Vizsla supports uh, under the creators and innovators uh, program. And um, by the time this releases, uh, we will have launched um, what we're calling the Vizsla CT Shaper rankings as well. Um, you know, obviously it's oh, not wow. as uh, diverse a board builder collection as you, as you find outside of the tour because, you know, they're all, you know, 
chopping away and, and mining away at trying to find the most high performance craft on the planet for the CT surfers. But, you know, the board builder community is, is so essential to surfing. And as a surfer, I think we all just obsess over boards all the time. And, you know, the conversation both on broadcast and around the community that follow the championship tour always talks about like, who's got the hot hand, who's got the best team. How are those boards performing? Who's switching? You know, it's, it's, it's just fascinating. And, you know, working with, with Vinny and Paul at, at, at Vizsla developed this ranking program where we're going to track, you know, how the board builders are performing over the course of the CT. And so it's just cool that, that there is that connection for them, you know, even if the approach to their program is super diverse and not necessarily CT, um, sort of surfers, like the board builder element translates as well, you know, and, and it, it, it'll be fun to kind of track that through the season, I think. Oh yeah. That sounds insane. I didn't even know about that. That's yeah. That's secret great, stuff I, as of today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Epic. No, I, I, you know, like at the end of the day, like I said, we need our champions and there is a, um, a rubric and a metric that helps us to find one. Cause that's just the map. Right. We, you know, we have to have sure. some sort of structure to give, uh, an equal opportunity for everyone to engage in that like basketball the ball goes in the hoop you can't run with the ball you may not like it and if you don't like that go play soccer or go play you know whatever football or whatever that is American football but like <laughs> with surfing we run into the real um, the, the real uh, I would call it maybe a threat to the diversity mm. of our culture when we try to create singularity in the way we ride waves, even mm. to the point where if we only say, this is the way we ride big waves, this is the way we ride little waves, this is the way we ride the best waves on the planet. Like we, it, it, to me, it just, there's, a, there's a, a threat to the diversity of the way we ride these waves, which is not what surfing is. And you know, if WSL is taking these approaches to really exemplify alternative ways of riding waves and the different parts of this entire culture, like, um, I think it's just really great for everyone. There's, there's so many new surfers that are coming into this culture. And like, I sometimes think about it as like a sphere. And if the WSL is like kind of pumping a lot of the financial resources into this industry, and it's an entry point to a lot of people, I know I'm probably like way out in the next street over in terms of like the WSL championship tour. I would like to think that by having relationships with the heartbeat or maybe the mind of surfing mm. or whatever it is, being even out on the periphery, it allows people an opportunity to start to explore the diversity of this surfing culture universe, you know, and I enjoy being way out there different just like other people like Ryan Birch, you know, mm. and like uh, Bryce Young's and Craig's and Harry Bryant's and Dylan Graves and all these people who are, you know, like on these crazy trips in the universe where people who, you know, have time to explore further across our culture can use these avenues and these little like tunnels and veins. Um, yeah, it's great. And that's awesome that... I, um, I yeah, I like the way you put that. Like, and I, I think you're right. Like, I think it is, it's, it's a broad ecosystem, but as we've talked about almost through the whole conversation, like there is so much connection um, and the strength of that connection is not always appreciated, but you know, the, the, I, I think of the WSL is kind of like an engine, you know, in the sense like this is one engine in surfing where we're creating conditions to see if you can progress surfing in this way, you know, um, and, and, you know, searching for different waves and certainly the kind of surfing that you do is, is another engine, you know, but, but you're then able to draw inspiration from what, you know, the CT surfers are doing and vice versa. And, and I think of that with the, the Vizsla CT shaper rankings as well is not really that different because, um, you know, you have your board builders, like your Brit Merricks at Channel Islands who are trying to craft these, these, vessels for CT surfing and for crowning a world champion, but he's going to be learning so much about board design through that process and that experience that will then translate back into different models like single fins or triplane holes or fishes or whatever. And so it's it, at its best, I think surfing is this really like beautiful symbiotic relationship between these different engines. Totally. Like, I mean, Brit, he's, you know, shaping, shaping boards, like for guys like Emai, you know, and who's mm. now like on the tour. 
but he's also shaping for Mikey Fibb. So mm-hmm. like it's like you know in the shaping room you're you're it just would be interesting to see the type of crossover even in those environmental spaces like yeah it's I I love it I love diversity and I I feel like um just like a biological organism when you have a lot more diversity you you have a better chance at the ecosystem surviving an attack by something you know so there can be easily one thing that disrupts the thruster shortboard like clark foam at one point or whatever sure. you know whatever yeah. fin boxes are no longer a thing and now everyone's gonna ride finless and like who knows right. but by having different ways of riding waves we as a culture and like this organism um will survive longer you know and and that's like from a from a cultural standpoint that's how we've done it too we've we ride waves all the way with our boogie board with our body mm. long board short boards like traditionally we've we have so many words for wave riding um, that you ride with a canoe, you ride with a branch. Like there's so many ways of like doing these cool ways of being a part of it that it's lasted thousands of years, you know? And, um, yeah, hopefully we're, we're still on that trip. You've been recently, you know, profiled in publications such as the New York times, you know, on NBC, CBS, and certainly within the surfing world, but, you know, not just more and more often, not just for your work, but really for kind of who you are. And, and, you know, uh, you're still putting out like high level edits about surfing. And, and I'm just curious, you know, heading into 2023 here after the opening month, like what are some of the current projects you're working on and, and, and how do you see the rest of the year playing out for you? Yeah, I mean, definitely Megalab is going to be a big push this year for me. Like I would love to, um, just bring more people into that that space of science really just showing science is is fun and it's a cool part of life that surfing can benefit from for sure like mega lab is there with my science um you know i also would like to celebrate other surfers and and be a part of more like um surf like just surfing for sure like that's always something that has helped me to find inspiration throughout my whole like life day-to-day lifestyle so I don't really know if I have I I have goals but you know like when you put the lures out in the ocean I uh I don't want to I don't want to say I'm fishing you know like I jinx it so um yeah a lot of things coming up I'm sure that I'm going to be focusing um on elevating scientific literacy through surfing like to me that that's to partner with people and organizations that want to really raise the flag and shout the message that science is for everyone, uh, especially for surfers. I love it, you know, and really appreciate it. And, you know, through your, your research and your education and your surfing, you, you continue to work to improve ocean literacy on a daily basis as well. So, so Cliff, you know, thanks so much for your leadership in keeping the people of the world and, and around us sort of constantly top of mind. Um, but before you do go, we did put out uh, questions to the Instagram community um, for those who follow us at, at the lineup pod. And we've got a few for you. Um, first question is from at Coco underscore, underscore Christ, who asks, what can someone stuck in middle America do to help surfing slash surf culture? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> middle America now there's wave pools. <laughs> coming up in there so maybe surf uh, could be one but i think someone in in middle america to recognize that the ocean affects us you know and i think it's trying to understand what is your relationship look like with the ocean um we can kind of group ourselves into those who are kind of recreating it those who are um exploiting it uh, those who are maybe um trying to be activists and conserving it and it's okay to be in all of those. Like, no, I think maybe it's a blending of different across the different categories. There's no one category, but, you know, realizing what your specific relationship is, even in the middle of the continent, which from a scientific standpoint, everyone depends on the ocean tremendously. You know, every three out of four breaths, every other breath essentially is as a result of having a healthy ocean. So just breathing, you're already using the ocean. And if that's just the basic level of uh, your connection, maybe that can help you think about it more because 
if you're listening to this podcast, if you're on the the podcast, you're interested in the ocean, you're going to get there. Like, you know, Coco, will, you'll, you'll probably get there sooner than later. And developing your identity of what your relationship is with the ocean will just prepare you for when you get there. Love it. Uh, next question is from Et uh, Romy Riddle, who asks, uh, what was your PhD title, a synopsis of the research, and how did you end up researching this specific topic? I feel like you answered the synopsis and how you got there, but what was the title of your uh, PhD research? Oh, I, shucks. I can't really remember the exact title. I think it was something <laughs> like um, multi-omic character right uh, multi-omic characterization of human environmental interactions or something like that but i don't know yeah. why you can't remember that that's so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and it went good he went, good. went pretty good good good, good. <laughs> <laughs> worked out um last question from the instagram community that we picked we got a lot more but we picked three um from at right.fam who asks what do you find more fulfilling discovering new things in science or writing new waves this seems like an unfair question, but I'll let you do it. <laughs> I mean, what I'm realizing now is that they are interconnected, like truly, like even with riding, like I've never surfed cloud break and being able to surf cloud break this year with um, an understanding of the these reef features that define why it's barreling. Like they're not mutually ex exclusive anymore. And I think hopefully um, that's an example that that's the way the future in society is going. Like you can, you shouldn't feel like uh, you have to give up your hobbies or your passions in order to be a, a good contributor to society. I think they can, you just got to be a little creative and then it'll, it'll come together. Love it. Well, thanks to everyone who uh, sent questions in at, at the lineup pod. Uh, we are now down to the lightning round. Uh, these are 10 questions for you to answer uh, as quickly as you can. And I feel like the first one's going to be unfair, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. Um, uh, hopefully this might, this might expose my, uh, my, my, my academic side. I'm pretty slow <laughs> at answering <laughs> stuff. So I'll try my best. First question, if you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Um, <laughs> that, that's probably the hardest one, the question. <laughs> is, hey, you're pro it's probably um, the hardest one I've asked for <laughs> you more than anyone else over 100 plus episodes. Um, if I had to have one type of board to for the rest of my life, thruster, single fin, bonzer, twin, I would probably have to take out hot price single fin. This, Coffee or because, tea? Oh, no, sorry, excuse yeah. me. Oh, yeah, just because, I mean, single fin, I feel it's the most, um, di like, um, Depending, you can change your board up with a single fin to ride anywhere from two to 20 feet barrels or slopey mush burgers. So the single fin probably in my mind is the, uh, the most versatile fin setup. Good answer. Good reason. Uh, next question. Coffee or tea? Tea. Burrito or pizza? Either as long as they're non-dairy. <laughs> Lactose intolerant. <laughs> What, what, what's better a non a non-dairy burrito or a non-dairy pizza uh non-dairy burrito for sure yeah okay. I, I, right. I guess I would, if there's no ch if cheese it was only regular cow cheese i would probably go burrito and just get fish fair enough uh where am i at? last book you read the last book i read was uh cannibalism uh brian schultz yeah it was exploring the social dynamics of cannibalism <laughs> all right uh, it, yeah it was, it was a new york times bestseller so don't judge me <laughs> no i'm not judging that's the first time anyone said that book on this part so just for just for your new knowledge uh best surf film ever uh best surf film ever um ah uh, like that's a is there any way to be more specific of what type of best best uh best studied Best nope, feeling. This is for you to define. Number one, all time for me. Uh, 
many classic moments. Mm. Gary Kippel, like he uh, call upon a soundtrack, buttons, Kaluhio Kalani, Dane Kioloha, Larry Bertelman, uh, Mike Hall. Yeah, the classic, many classic moments. Great one. Uh, what is one wave you never have to go back to? One wave I will never have to go back to. Oh, man. I, I feel there. I need to go back to every wave. Uh, there's there's no wave that I... Th if I had a bad experience, that's I got to go back even more of, a, more of a reason now. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, if you only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life, which would it be? Uh, the only wave would be my home break, Honolii. It's a uh, C grade wave at best, but it's home. And yeah, I love the people there and I, I love the coral reef there and it's where my family comes from. So yeah, the local Honolii Beach Park. Best person to share a lineup with? Oh man, um, that, I can't even... I mean, best person to share the lineup with. Um, there's so many people that I want to say, like, I can't, uh, do they have to be alive? Is this like someone yeah. that I, anyone you want, anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I could, um, share the lineup with someone, I would really love to share the lineup with, uh, Prince Jonah Kuhio. He was, uh, the first one of the him and his brothers were the first maybe all, all the Pequoy brothers all three of them they're the first people to share surfing outside of Hawaii in the 1800s at uh, San Lorenzo River Mouth and uh, yeah Prince Jonah Kuhio he's just a, a really big um, inspiration to me for the Hawaiian community and also for his surfing ability beautiful uh, next question who is the worst person to share a lineup with oh I mean, the worst person to share the lineup with. Um, I don't know. I, I, I try to give people benefit of the doubt. There's, there, there's, I don't know. I, I can't even think of a, me maybe. I don't know. <laughs> like my own worst enemy out there in my mind sometimes. <laughs> that's fair. That's a good. That's a good answer. Also, the first time we've heard that one, but I, I, I like it. That might be. That's a good one. Um, okay, last question. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by being more present. Cliff Capono, thank you so much uh, for coming on the lineup. Congratulations again on the WSL Impact Award. Thank you for everything you're doing. And um, man, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, we'd love to have you back sometime because I think we could we can dive into all sorts of stuff. Dave, thank you. It's been an honor.